Um, this week, we will be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're, we'll be looking at verses 6 through 13. As you're turning there, I um, wanted to just thank you so much for the privilege of being with you to open God's Word this morning. My name is Kendall Magani. I work with our college ministry here at Second Presbyterian um, and have since 2010. And, um, and it's a privilege to be here with you, guys, you men this morning. Um, a few weeks ago, Barton actually reminded you of something Sandy used to say. You're not apostles, you're not prophets, but you are the most important men in Memphis. And, um, and I believe that's true. Uh, not because you're the best looking men in Memphis. Uh, no, not because you're the brightest, not because um, you guys are the, the, the most influential men in the entire city. Um, some of you guys went to Tennessee, so you can't, that can't be the case. No, it's actually, um, it's actually because you men have given your um, energy, your mornings, your time to studying God's Word and mining the depths of the gospel of God's grace. And we just read this lyric, and you guys take this seriously. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. And you guys have done just that and I'm thankful to be here with you this morning. In this letter to the Thessalonians, what we have is a riveting picture of what it means to see the good news of God's grace come into a person's life, to a people's life, and to their world, and to turn their life inside out, to turn their world upside down. And that's because the gospel, which you have given your, your time to on Thursday mornings to studying deeply, it transforms people. And the gospel transforms the world that those people live in. But if you're anything like me, you, you wonder sometimes if that's actually true. Is it true that the gospel actually does and can turn people's lives inside out, turn their world upside down? Maybe if, if like me, you look around at the world that we live in, Maybe it's a family member or the place that you work or, and, and you wonder, can, can the gospel of God's grace really grip this person and turn their world inside out and upside down? Is the gospel really that powerful? This morning in our text, what we have is a testimony from Paul at just how powerful this gospel is to transform a people to transform the world that they live in. If you need to be reminded this morning about how powerful that gospel really is, then take a look with us again in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be reading in chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. But now that Timothy has come from us to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Brothers, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let me pray. Father, would you open up our eyes and our hearts to see again in this portion of your word the good news that transforms our lives from the inside out and the world that we live in. Show us Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. It was just after spring break in 2007. Um, I had just given my life to the Lord, and I had a neighbor, a girl that had said, there's a prayer meeting 
in two days. And I'm like, well, I'm a new, brand new baby Christian. I'm, I'm supposed to do things like this. And so I'm absolutely going to go to this prayer meeting. Well, I show up to this prayer meeting and find that it was actually at the house of my team chaplain uh, in uh, the school that I played for, college football for. And as I walked up, I, I was so excited. I walked in the door, I bust in there, and there's our team chaplain, Stuart. He's sitting right there in the, in the little foyer area in this home. And I said, Stuart, I did it. And he's like, you did, you did what? I said, I gave my life to Christ. And I buzzed right past Stuart into, the, into my very first ever prayer meeting. All happy-go-lucky and all the rest. Stuart told me later that when he'd, he'd seen me coming through the screen door, he thought to himself, why in the world is he here? Who invited this guy? Does he actually even know what this is? And then when I told him that I had given my life to Christ, he was kind of like, yeah, we'll see. Two full years of prayer and sharing Jesus with me. And when I told him that I had given my life to the Lord, he was kind of like, eh, we'll see how this works out. Brothers, I want to... Uh, I'm standing here. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm right here. The gospel of God's grace is powerful to change people's lives. And sometimes we underestimate its power. We underestimate how powerful the gospel of grace can be to turn a life inside out and to turn the world upside down. What we have in this letter that Paul has been writing to the Thessalonians as Todd even reminded us last week, that he was, just, he was just there with them for at most six weeks. What we have here is we have a testimony of how powerful this grace is. And, and honestly, because of the circumstances, because Paul was only there for six weeks, because him and Silas were driven out of this city by persecution, he really wondered, are they... How are they doing? <laughs> How are they actually, is the gospel taking root there? Are they actually transformed by it? So in the passage that we looked at last week, he sends Timothy in chapter 3, verse 5, to learn about their faith. And again, we cannot entirely presume upon Paul's motives, but it makes sense, doesn't it? There's a lot of persecution around. He was there for only six weeks. How much, how much can be done in such a little amount of time? Are these, are these Christians, are they actually standing firm in their faith? Can the gospel turn their world upside down? Brothers, do you ever look at the world around us? Do you ever look at your family? Do you ever look at a coworker? Do you ever, do you ever wonder like, man, that's a, that's a pretty dark place. That's a pretty lost place. These people are pretty far off. I wonder if God's mercy and grace can really transform them. In this passage that we have, we find that that's exactly what God has done. It, it, it's like Paul had sprinkled a little money, you know, in a retirement fund, and he just wanted to check and see how it was going, and he shows up and it's like, you're kidding me. It's like he had a fantasy lineup uh, for fantasy football, didn't expect much out of it, checks it Sunday afternoon, and his team is winning. No, it's far greater than that. He, he finds that from Timothy's testimony that these brothers and sisters in faith are standing fast in the Lord. And all this does is testify to us again that God can take a little of what we have to give because of the power of his gospel and change people forever and the worlds that they live in. And this morning, brothers, what I want us to be exhorted and encouraged and inspired, maybe you have lost a little bit of your hope that the gospel can transform. But I want to I want to encourage us because the gospel really is that powerful to give ourselves afresh to spiritual influence in the place that God has put you. I want to encourage you that God has put you in the place that he has for a reason. And he intends, even if you have a little to give, to turn you inside out continually and your world upside down. And this morning, I want you to be encouraged by Paul's testimony of spiritual influence in three ways. First, 
I want you to see the prize of spiritual influence. It's in verses 6 through 8. In chapter 2, Paul calls these Thessalonians his glory and joy. He had toiled night and day proclaiming the gospel, exhorting them, encouraging them, sharing with them not only the gospel message, but his whole life. And so he wants to check on them. He wants to see how they're doing. And again, considering the brief amount of time he spent there and how hot the heat of persecution was around him, he wants to know how are they doing. And so he sends Timothy. And this is the report. This is the report that Paul gets back from Jesus. They're standing fast. There's, it's good news. In fact, it's incredible. The word that, that's used here to express how they were doing is the same root word that's used for the word gospel itself. The news was so good that it likened even to the gospel. These believers were standing fast in faith and love. John Stott says this is the sum total of godliness. And this report that came back was really good. And Paul is elated. He's so excited about this good news. He's so excited that these This church, in the midst of all of the surrounding circumstances, are standing firm in their faith. He's elated about it. And this news that Timothy delivers is so good because these Macedonian believers are standing fast in faith. He's excited about their faith. You see that here in this passage. The character of their belief was solid. The character of their belief was solid, we, we learned that in chapter 1, verse 8, that their faith was contagious. Uh, their faith was like, it was sounding forth like a trumpet in that, in that, it was contagious, their faith. But not only that, we learned that their faith was radical. Also in chapter 1, in verses 9 and 10, we found that this good news of grace that had taken these people's lives and turned them inside out, It actually turned them away from living idols. (laughs) It was that radical. But also their faith was enduring. And this is what encourages Paul so much, is that their faith wasn't just some spark, but it was an enduring and consistent faith. In 2 Thessalonians, the second letter that he's written to this church, he commends them, he boasts about them, this church specifically among all the churches of God. For their steadfastness and faith. And, and the, amidst their persecutions and all of their afflictions, he's encouraged about the endurance of their faith. They are standing fast in the Lord. And Paul is through the roof about this. But he doesn't stop there. It's not just that these Macedonian Christians believed the right way. It's not just that the character of their belief was solid. He's also so encouraged about their love. The character of their belief was solid, certainly, but it was also the character of their behavior that sent Paul through the roof. Their love was active. In chapter 1, verse 6, we find that these Macedonian Christians were imitators of Paul and Timothy. They had even become an example to the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The way that they were living, it wasn't just intellectual was practical. It wasn't just orthodoxy. It was orthopraxy. Their lives and their love was real. It was active. And it was also authentic. When Timothy brings this report back to them, to Paul specifically, he's so excited because they actually longed to see Paul. And if you remember the context of this book specifically, there was likely those around this this church that said, man, Paul hit the eject button. Things got hot. He left you guys. And what we find actually is that they still loved Paul the way that Paul loved them. Brothers, Paul is so excited because their faith and their love was a testimony of the power of God's grace. And that's the report that Timothy brings back. But not just that. Paul is relieved. What we find here is that this news brings comfort and encouragement to Paul. He had had suffered persecution. In fact, if you go back and read Acts 16 and 17, you find that Paul suffered 
in Philippi before he got here. He was literally driven out while he was in Thessalonica, and then he went to Berea. And, and, and persecution was ahead of him there as well. And so you think about Paul and his, and it says even here that he, in, in the midst of much affliction and distress, he's comforted, he's encouraged about how these Christians are doing. So much so, in verse 8, he says, for now we really live if you're standing fast in the Lord. We really live. We're so encouraged. We're so comforted. We're so relieved by the news about your faith. For Paul, the influence that he had had among these Thessalonians was his prize. He loved to hear how they were doing. And he hardly could stop himself from praising God in prayer. <laughs> he, he's gotten this report. He's so relieved by it. And he just, he just breaks out into this kind of you know, prayer as he's writing to them, this prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude. This, this, he's received the prize. They're doing well. Since the fall of 2016, I've worked with the University of Memphis football team here. And our, um, my first fall here... Uh, a, a friend of ours that works with our college ministry and I, we, we stumbled into the dorms and met a group of freshman guys that we started a Bible study with there. And, um, and, and through years of, of football guys, they're hard to get around. They have a very busy schedule and they think they're really cool. And so it's really hard sometimes, you know. They'll take four steps back and then two steps, or four, four steps forward and two steps back. And, you know, we didn't get to see them that often. And and so we, 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 we just loved on them and had them in our home and, and, um, and tried to model godliness in front of them and taught them scripture consistently. And honestly, um, with how erratic it all was, we just never knew how it was going. In January of their junior year, I remember sitting down with about six of these men that I was investing in. And I said, guys, I just want you to imagine what this year might look like. Could this be the year where you walk with God more intently than ever before? Two months later, COVID hits. <laughs> of those six guys, three of them, I think, uh, go on to, you know, work out for the NFL. One of them transfers to TCU. And I have kept in touch with them somewhat, but nothing like what I was before. Just last week, I FaceTime one of these guys, and uh, he told me that that day he was starting a Bible study on his team. And I about fell out of my truck. I was like, you're kidding me. What are you going to talk to him about? He said, the gospel. I said, man, that's amazing. Well, what are you going to do? He's like, hey, you remember that? We were talking about that, uh, that illustration you drew on a pizza box. It's it's about how man's on this side and Jesus is on this side, or we're, you know, God's on this side and Jesus the cross. And, and I was like, this is amazing. It actually worked. You know, it, the gospel really is changing this man and the world that he lives in. And I had no expectation that that would be the case. I told him I couldn't pray for his team because they're not the Cowboys, but uh, I, 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 I did, I was excited. Brothers, let us not underestimate the power of the gospel. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. What's, what compares? What compares to the privilege of seeing God's gospel work powerfully in someone's life? What compares to knowing that the God of the universe who calls you his son has invited you into his kingdom building work for your joy and for his glory in a billion years, what will compare with the prize of knowing that God has used you and the life of someone near you? Who is that person? Who is that person that God's given you to invest in? I want to encourage you with the prize of spiritual influence. But we also see the purpose of spiritual influence in verse 10. See, you might think that because of this report and how excited Paul is, the work was done. That's it. Pack up the bags. They're Christians. They prayed the prayer. 
their faith and their love are firm. They're standing fast. It's over. No. The goal of spiritual influence, the purpose, isn't just getting people in. Because the gospel is not just about getting people in. See, the purpose of the gospel is, is to take us home. The purpose of the gospel is glorification. The same gospel which justifies is the gospel that sanctifies, is the gospel that glorifies. You see this elsewhere in Paul, particularly in the church at Philippi. That God has begun a good work in you. He will bring it about to completion. And the logic is really simple. <laughs> if Paul had a heartbeat and the Thessalonians were not yet glorified, there's more to do. <laughs> there's more spiritual influence to give. I remember Sandy uh, Wilson once saying that, kind of giving a tagline of his job. What's his job as a pastor? And he said simply, my job is to get God's people home with joy. And I don't think that's just the work of a pastor, brother. That's our work. Because the gospel of God's grace takes us home with joy. See, the ultimate end, the ultimate telos, the ultimate goal, the ultimate place that God is taking us with this news is this place of perfection where we will behold the face of our Savior. And if you have a heartbeat and there's someone around you that's not yet glorified, then God has given you influence to give. This is why Paul says, we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. We say, Kendall, we just said that their faith was great. Well, why is there still something missing? They're not home yet, brothers. John Stott said that Paul longed to see these Christians complete, whole, mature. So, so what is, how is it that God uses us to influence others? I want you to see two things. First, it's presence. It's presence. Paul's prayer here is that he would see them again. That he may impart to them and supply to them what is lacking in their faith. For Paul, the old adage, more is caught than taught, is true. That was the, that was the way. That was the means for his influence. He wanted to be with them. This is why when describing his ministry among them, he reminds them that he not only shared the gospel, but he shared his own life. You can teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. He wanted to give them not just knowledge, but a lifestyle to emulate. And this is important. This is important for us. This is important for followers of Jesus, especially people in this Macedonian church who are experiencing persecution. L last week... Um, Todd reminded or, or quoted something from Alistair Begg. He said, Christians are increasingly going to have to choose between obedience and comfort. The next decade will not bring apathy to the gospel, but antagonism. And I, I, I am more convinced than I ever have been as I work with the next generation. What, what the next generation of Christians most need is they most need you to show them how to retell the gospel to show them how to reimagine the church and the city. They, they need you to show them how to repair what is broken. They need you to show them how to suffer for Christ. They need to see it. And so Paul knew that by being with these believers, he might actually show them and be with them. And it was his presence, his life's example, that would be used by God to grow them up into maturity. Uh, but lest we think that it was just Paul thinking that his life was the ultimate answer, let's allow this passage to check us in the place that we love the most, our prayer life. He says, we pray most earnestly night and day. It was not only presence, but prayer. Prayer. Ongoing, fervent prayer. If we would influence the people around us, if Paul would influence this church, he breaks out into prayer for them. God would use us for the spiritual maturing of the people that we invest in. We must be given to prayer. I, I confess myself, there is a di direct connection 
for me between my prayer life and the trust I have and the gospel to change people. Let me, let me flip that over on its head for a second. When I'm underestimating the power of the gospel to transform someone's life, it usually shows itself in my prayer life. Paul is begging the Lord earnestly, night and day. This is shorthand. We also know in this, path, or in this book that he was actually working all the time. So Paul is just in this, in this position, this season of constantly praying for this church that they would continue into maturity because he believed that spiritual influence was given by God through us via our prayers. And I just want to remind us, he didn't even know this church that well. He had only been with them some six weeks. And all this does is really prove to us where Paul put the hope of his influence. He put the hope of his influence in God. He placed the hope of his influence in the powerful God, in the powerful gospel, which he knew he could be a vessel for, but it was God's power that would change these people. As I became a believer on my football team in college, I <laughs> stumbled through praying for my teammates and, and awkwardly, I mean awkwardly, sharing Christ with my teammates and, um, and came up with all of these fascinating ways to try to influence them spiritually, the most sophisticated of which we would spend time playing Mario Kart, uh, which is a video game after practice most days. And... God had uniquely given this one guy a supernatural ability in Mario Kart. He always used to destroy us. His name was Nick, and he'd come and play with us, and uh, we created a green jacket for whoever had won that day that he continued to wear, and he just wore it into the locker room and through the campus, just, you know, push it in our faces. And, and through that relationship, on a regular basis, we would just have opportunity to talk with him about Christ. And lo and behold, Nick became a Christian. <laughs> and... Uh, we joked around. It wasn't Ryan or Dustin or myself that had led him to the Lord. It was actually Mario. Mario led Nick to Christ. And I'll never forget going back to that chaplain that had led me to the Lord and said, Okay, so what's the plan with Nick? How are we going to help this guy grow? And he looked at me and said, You're the plan. And I was like, I just became a believer about six months ago. He said, well, that's great. you got a six-month head start. And he gave me this simple thing. He just said, Kendall, concern yourself with being much with God and being much with Nick. And I think, I think that's exactly what Paul is after here. Who do you need to spend time with? How does your desire to see men or women, or your children, or your grandchildren influence? How ought that shape the way that you pray? What prayers are you begging God for? Brothers, if you have a heartbeat and there's someone around you that's not yet home with joy, then let's give ourselves to being with them and showing them the way and begging God to continue to transform their lives. So we have the prize and the purpose but I also want you to see the power of spiritual influence. What was it that Paul prayed for these young persecuted Christians? What was going to get them to the end? What, what would continue to form and to shape these people to persevere amidst the persecution that they were facing? What would keep them standing fast in the Lord? Well, I'd like to submit to you that Paul, in his prayer for these Thessalonians, looks nothing like the self-improvement narrative that we've come accustomed to today. Some of you may be familiar or are not with a guy named David Goggins. David Goggins is an ultra-marathon runner, meaning he, he runs long, long distances, sometimes for days, over 100 miles. He's an ultra-cyclist. He's a former Navy SEAL. He's a public speaker and motivator. He wrote a, a book called... He Can't Hurt Me was released in 2019. And if I could just quickly summarize um, and emulate his motivation tactics, what I would have to do is basically cuss at you for the next five minutes. At the end, 
tell you to stay hard. That's what he does. Stay hard. Is that how Paul <laughs> seeks to pray for and influence these Thessalonians? Well, is it that Paul wanted these Thessalonians to will themselves into 4 a.m. chest beating, self-directed kind of perseverance and told them to stay hard? Not at all. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. If you study these two prayers that Paul prays for these believers, you find that they have something deeply in common. The gospel. And this prayer that Paul prays here at the end of this passage, is a, it's a window into his theology. How do people change? It's a window into his view of sanctification. And this perspective is so important to our understanding of spiritual influence. Core to understanding how Christians are formed into the likeness of Jesus is the gospel. It's the good news. So let me prove this to you. Look with me at verse 12. He says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. That may ring a bell for you, as we do for you. It may ring a bell because this prayer that Paul prays is, a, is modeled after Jesus' prayer. It's modeled after Jesus' example. Maybe you remember it like this. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. With Jesus' crucifixion imminent, sitting around his disciples, he takes a towel and washes their feet in an example of humility, in an example of self-sacrifice, in an example he realized when he gave his life for us at the cross, he said to his disciples, as I love you humbly, as I love you sacrificially, this is how you ought to love one another. The way I lay my life down for you, this is how you ought to lay your life down for one another. This brings great clarity to this prayer that Paul prays. Don't you see the gospel logic? We pray that you would increase and abound in love for one another as we do for you. Let's just look at this linearly for a second. Jesus had laid down his life for Paul and it transformed him from the inside out. And Paul had come to these Thessalonians and he had, he had toiled and labored in love for them. And he's saying, in just the same way as Paul and I and Silas and Timothy here, as we have laid down our life for you, now you lay your life down for those around you. You see the gospel logic. The gospel comes to us, it transforms us, and it spills out of us so that we love those around us as Christ has loved us. That's gospel logic. And he wanted them to know how he had loved them and how he had been loved. And this isn't unique to Paul. We know that he writes similar things in other letters. Think about Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the gospel. And that's what informs Paul's prayers. This was the power <laughs> that would transform these people is the good news about God's grace. But look at this other prayer that's also anchored in the gospel as well. He says, so that you may be established in your hearts, blameless in holiness. Paul prays that these believers, their hearts specifically, would be blameless in holiness. That the gospel would continue to transform these Thessalonians at the heart level. See, see the good news about, about grace, about the gospel, is not that it just changes us outwardly. Ah, oh, now that was the story about the Pharisees. They were whitewashed tombs, but inwardly were dead bones. No, instead Paul is, is saying the gospel 
of God's grace transforms your loves and therefore transforms your life. It changes what you love. And it changes how you live. And the blamelessness that Paul is praying for them is a purity of heart. That their loves would shift, that their loves would change, that they would stop loving what they used to and start loving what God does. This is how he says it in Titus 3, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. The same grace that saves us is the, is the grace that trains us, trains us to love and to live differently. And so Paul is praying here that these Thessalonian Christians would be blameless in holiness at a heart level. And in this, you see this already not yet tension where these Thessalonians are and where they will be at the return of Jesus. These are two gospel-driven prayers because this is where Paul situates and realizes that God's power is directed through the gospel and through his vessels to change people's lives. Brothers, the Lord Jesus, he's coming back. And he's coming for his prize, his glorious inheritance, you. He's coming back to get us. He's coming back for you. He's coming back for what he's paid for in full. In his purpose, as the great shepherd of the sheep, the one who for the joy before him laid down his life is to get us home with joy. And there will be a day when he steps off of his royal throne and he comes back and he makes all things new. And he displays for all time power, his redeeming power. And he has given us the privilege of experiencing the prize of spiritual influence and the privilege of entering into people's lives to see them home with joy. And he has given us power in the good news about God's grace. Brothers, may it be said of us in this room that we really are the most important men in Memphis because we have the most important and the most powerful message that can change people's lives from the inside out and turn their worlds upside down. May that be said. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these men. What an encouragement that they are. Would you keep them going? Would you encourage them? Would you open their eyes to see the men and women, the places that you've put them? And would you revive our hope in the power of your grace to change people from the inside out? And God, would you turn this city upside down? Would you bring your kingdom here in the city of Memphis as it is in heaven? And all of these men pray together and say, amen. 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 Thank you, brothers.